Have you ever wondered about the dark art of deception? Today, we are uncovering the top most cunning scams in history. These stories of trickery are so bold and clever that they could have been ripped right from a thriller novel. Or rather, I guess a thriller novel might have used them for inspiration. From audacious con artists to grand-scale financial frauds, we're revealing methods so devious that you're going to be left questioning everything. Briex Minerals Ltd. A small Canadian mining company became the center of one of the most infamous gold mining scandals in history during the 1990s. This story unfolded in Indonesia, on the island of Borneo, where the company claimed to have struck gold, quite literally at a site called Busan. Michael de Guzman, a Filipino geologist who probably wished that he had a metal detector, was the mastermind behind this so-called mysterious find. Oh, yeah. As news of the discovery spread, the company's stock prices shot up like a prospector's dreams. Investors and major mining companies worldwide caught up in a gold mm. fever were dazzled by what seemed to be the motherlode of all gold mines. At its peak, Briax's market cap hit an incredible $6 billion, turning what was once a modest company into a mining behemoth overnight. Much like a Cinderella story, but with gold instead of glass slippers. <laughs> However, this glittering story was built not on solid gold, but on a foundation of pyrite, fool's gold. The painful truth was that there was no gold. The core samples had been salted with gold from other sources. This spicing up of samples was sophisticated enough to fool the initial testing, creating an illusion that would make a magician envious. The plot began to unravel in 1997 when Freeport McMoran, another mining company, did a bit of digging of their own. Their analysis showed that the gold at Busong was as scarce as honest politicians, contrasting Briax's claims. Oh, fiddle faddle. As suspicions rose, Michael de Guzman, the central character in this gold-digging drama, mysteriously fell from a helicopter over the Indonesian jungle. His death spurred conspiracy theories, with some wondering if he'd taken up a new career in skydiving, or if he really had met a more sinister end. Artur Vergio Alves dos Reis orchestrated one of the most audacious frauds in history, a scam so immense that it shook the very foundations of Portugal's economy in the 1920s. Alves dos Reis, a man with a mind for mischief, embarked on a bold journey to pull off a scam that involved none other than the Bank of Portugal, the nation's central bank, proving that sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, especially when it involves a ton of fake money. His plan was devilishly simple, and yet it was brilliant forge a contract that appeared to grant him the right to print legitimate Portuguese banknotes. Alves dos Reis convinced the esteemed British banknote printing company Waterloo and Sons Limited that he was acting on behalf of the Bank of Portugal. With this deception, he managed to have them print around 200,000 contos of esculos, an equivalent to about 1% of Portugal's GDP at the time. The notes were indistinguishable from the real ones, because in essence, they were real. What a fox! Made by the same company that printed legitimate Portuguese currency, the money flowed into the economy, and Alves dos Reis lived a life of luxury, probably wondering if they'd ever make a movie about his life. Mm. As the notes began to circulate, they inevitably caused inflation. Mm. The sudden and unexplained increase in money supply raised a lot of suspicions. The Bank of Portugal, caught off guard and likely wondering why everyone suddenly became so rich, started an investigation, and then the shocking truth began to unfold. The conspiracy theories around this scandal are as fascinating as the scam itself. Some believe that Alves dos Reis was part of a larger network, possibly backed by foreign interests aiming to destabilize Portugal's economy. Or maybe aliens? Because why not? Others theorize that other influential figures in Portugal knew about the scam, but they turned a blind eye, either due to bribery or the belief that it could somehow benefit them in the long run. Like getting a starring role in that movie. Alves dos Reis' downfall was as dramatic as his rise. Arrested and tried, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, which gave him plenty of time to think about maybe starting a bit more legal of a business next time. Charles Ponzi's scheme is a story of greed and deception so famous it turned his name into shorthand for financial fraud. This story, straight out of the early 1920s in Boston, USA, features a Charles Ponzi, an Italian immigrant with an eye for opportunity and, as it turns out, a rather shaky moral compass. Ponzi stumbled upon a seemingly straightforward way to make a fortune, involving international postal reply coupons, which were basically the old-school version of a global currency for stamps. He figured out that thanks to the post-war economy, he could buy these coupons on the cheap in some countries and exchange them for more expensive stamps in the US. This idea might have had some merit if it wasn't for Ponzi's slight overestimation of its practicality. Promising his investors 50% return in just 90 days, Ponzi started attracting investors like bees to honey. 
His success hinged on using new investors' money to pay off the old ones, rather than actual profits from stamp arbitrage. This rob Peter to pay Paul strategy is what we now call a Ponzi scheme. The returns were so spectacularly attractive, and Ponzi played the part of the trustworthy businessman so well that people were practically tripping over themselves to give him their life savings. By 1920, <laughs> Ponzi was swimming in an ocean of cash, with around $15 million in his treasure chest. However, the facade started to pop when the Boston Post began snooping around. Mm. Their investigation revealed that Ponzi's grand plan was more fiction than fact. Ponzi found himself under arrest and facing a barrage of fraud charges. Charles Keating's scam is a classic example of how not to run a savings and loan association. Keating, a former lawyer and businessman with more ambition than sense, took over Lincoln Savings and Loan Association in 1984. Under his leadership, quote unquote, the institution embarked on a risky investment adventure that ultimately crashed, burning the investor's life savings in the process. Keating's strategy was like mixing dynamite with fire. He pivoted Lincoln from the snooze fest of home loans to risky investments in real estate, junk bonds, and art. This was similar to trading a reliable family sedan for a fleet of untested race cars. These ventures promised sky-high returns, but were as about as stable as a three-legged chair. So to fund these wild escapades, Keating turned to small investors, many of whom were elderly and probably thought Junk Bond was a new recycling initiative, selling them these uninsured and ultimately worthless bonds. When Lincoln Savings and Loan collapsed in 1989, it cost the government over three billion dollars, setting a high score for bailouts that stood out until the 2008 financial crisis. Over 20,000 investors, many retirees who dreamt of golden years rather than financial nightmares, were left holding the bag, with losses totaling over $285 million. Keating's affairs were not confined to financial fraud. He dabbled in politics, too, starring in the Keating 5 scandal, where he handed out a cool $1.3 million to five U.S. senators. This merry band included Alan Cranston, Dennis De Cochini, John Glenn, John McCain, and Donald W. Regal. Jr., who then allegedly returned the favor by pressuring regulators to ignore Lincoln's high-flying, high-risk antics. Eventually, Keating got his comeuppance, earning convictions for fraud, racketeering, and conspiracy, proving that while money can buy senators, it can't always buy freedom. The Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities LLC scam is like the Mount Everest of financial deceptions, orchestrated by none other than Bernard Madoff. Unearthed in 2008, the scandal takes the cake as the biggest instance of financial fraud in basically the history of the U.S. and probably the history of bad ideas. Bernard Madoff, the wizard behind this financial curtain, was a former Nasdaq chairman. He used his shiny reputation and standing in the industry as a trusty shield, attracting investors like a magnet. For years, it stood like a beacon of success, fooling the entire investment community. However, behind the scenes, Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme of epic proportions. Instead of actual profits, returns to investors were the financial equivalent of recycling, new capital paid in by other investors. This kind of operation needs a never-ending stream of new money. Investors <laughs> kissed goodbye to an estimated $65 billion, which included a heap of fabricated gains. The real cash tossed into the bonfire was about $18 billion. The victims included individual retirees dreaming of quiet beachside living, generous charities, and even universities who thought that they were backing a sure thing. The house of cards failed in 2008 when the economic downturn saw investors scrambling for their money. Suddenly unable to meet with these withdrawal requests, Madoff's elaborate web of lies started to unravel. Madoff's son, Mark and Andrew, who worked in the firm but claimed to be clueless about the fraud, handed dear old dad over to the authorities. Madoff was arrested and later pleaded guilty to 11 federal felonies. The judge then gave him a 150-year timeout in prison in 2009. Kenneth Lay and Jeffrey Skilling, the dynamic duo at the heart of the Enron saga, made history with one of the most shocking corporate scandals in American history. Under their guidance, Enron, once the Hercules of the energy world, transformed into a high-flying energy trading and utilities colossus. Its stock prices skyrocketed, making the company seem more magical than the existence of a a unicorn. Beneath this sparkling success was a convoluted web of deceit. The scam was an accountant's nightmare, using accounting loopholes and special purpose entities like they were going out of style, all to hide a huge debt and pump up the economy's profitability. While Lay and Skilling were painting a picture of Enron as a financial superman, the company was actually bleeding money. And this little misdirection didn't just trick investors and the public, it filled the pockets of executives with stock sales and bonuses, making them rich. 
When Enron hit bankruptcy in December of 2001, it actually set the record for the largest U.S. bankruptcy at that time. The impact was like a financial tsunami. Shareholders were out $11 billion. And many employees who had put all of their retirement money in the Enron basket ended up with a big old federal zero. And in the end, justice knocked on their door. Kenneth Lay and Jeffrey Skilling were found guilty of fraud and conspiracy. Skilling bagged the 24-year-old term in prison, which was later cut down to 14 years. The Enron melodrama brought out the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, a bit like financial guardrails, ensuring more transparency in the corporate world and financial reporting. So, do you find any of these cases surprising? Let us know in the comment section if you did. And don't forget to subscribe for more sickness. Until next time, keep an eye on your wallet and stay curious.